Hello, and welcome to another episode of Search Off the Record, a podcast coming to you from the Google Search team, discussing all things search and maybe having some fun along the way. My name is John, and I'm joined today by Lizzie and Gary from the Search Relations team, of which I'm also a part of. So how are you coping with the Swiss summer so far, Lizzie? I am not doing well. <laughs> I don't think that I know how to cool the apartment appropriately. It it just seems to get very hot, even though I am closing the blinds. And I don't know if there's a trick to it, or I just picked the wrong apartment, or what is happening. I don't know if you also have the same problem. It's the same here. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like in, in Switzerland, nobody has air conditioners, or like almost nobody. So you have to cope with it. I, th I think this might be one of the reasons why people in Europe just go on vacation for like several months in the summer. It's not hot in Europe. Maybe you have to go to some place where there are glaciers, I guess, like live in an ice cage. Gary is making a face. How are you doing, Gary? Yeah, I actually love it, hence the face. Also in my apartment, it's like 23 degrees Celsius, so it's perfectly fine. I thought you were saying it was humid. Outside is humid. Outside is now humid. it's not humid anymore. Mm. I mean, inside it's not humid anymore. So that's great. And I love the heat. So you are having a great time then in the heat wave. I'm having a great time. It's one of the reasons why I go to Singapore to be in a humid, extremely hot environment. Well, we used to go to Singapore. And now apparently the Singapore weather just came here. And that's very, very nice. I appreciate it. So ideal Gary climate. Correct. Yes. I should move to Singapore. I, I usually enjoy the weather in Singapore because then I feel a lot more happy going back to Switzerland where it's like, oh, <laughs> it's only like so many degrees here. This is nothing. <laughs> I can tolerate it. <laughs> but they have lots of AC there. So could you just avoid the heat if you wanted to? Well, you do have to go outside sometimes. Like for a commute, for example, you have to go outside. Hmm. So... Talking about blocking, last time we talked about blocking sites in search, uh, kind of from an owner point of view. And now it's our turn to ask Gary how that actually works in reality from a search engine point of view. What? Yeah. I, I was not. I what? Yeah. Tell us how it really works, Gary. So. I, I know we have like the crawling, indexing, and serving side of things, like those three big buckets. I guess are they buckets? I don't know. They bins. probably wouldn't bins, bins, systems. Like the engineers definitely want to not have them be called buckets, I guess, because that sounds kind of awkward. I think bucket is a good name for them. I like it. Yeah, it's fun to say bucket, you know? I work on the crawling bucket. Yeah, the bucket, crawl it bucket team. Bucket of crawling. It's a bucket of fun. Okay. No. <laughs> 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 Too far. <laughs> so looking at those three bucket systems, um, <laughs> how, how does the, the blocking side of things kind of flow in there? Is it just like a flag that someone sets and then everything gets processed normally? Or how does that actually work? As you said, we have those three buckets. And each of the things that we talked about in the last episode mapped to one of those buckets. Um, I think we talked about robots.txt. And then we talked about some meta tags, uh, specifically robots meta tags. And then we talked about maybe about the removals tool a little. And each of these things actually map to something within search, like one of the bigger systems that you mentioned, crawling, indexing, serving. And I think that's why removals in general are so chaotic uh, when we talk about them, because we have all these systems that have their own way to control what they ingest and how they process things. Right. Uh, so certain things, certain methods uh, can apply to various buckets or stages of search. Uh, so you sort of need to know how the systems work in order to know which method to pick. Would that be a right way to think about it? I think so. Um, I don't think it's necessary. But if you are dealing with removals often, then you probably want to understand those systems. Because if you are like, you can combine certain things in ways that will not work. Mm. For example, like you take the robots.txt disallow rule as a way to 
block something from search or remove something from search. And then let's say that that page is very, very popular on the internet. So we still want to index the URL of that page. And then your expectations are not met because you are still going to see that URL in search results, um, not the content, like the URL will be without a snippet, um, but the title link will still be there. And that's because sometimes that can happen. It's very rare compared to the rest of indexing. It's a like the robot URLs in our index is a tiny, tiny, tiny minority, but it can still happen nonetheless. And then if you want to remove that URL, then you would think that you can just put up a meta no index, meta robots no index uh, in the HTML or in their HTTP header, but then we would never see that ah. if if the robots TXC disallow is there. I see. So knowing when these things happen can help you sort of troubleshoot or like you're now aware that like, hey, Google may not see this thing that I'm putting up on my page because I have this first thing that's sort of blocking yeah. earlier on in the process. Yeah. So robots.txt is is basically all about crawling now, now that I think about it. Kind of like it has a sitemap file and where you can and can't crawl. So it's basically yes. for that. That's also one thing that we worked quite hard when we were open sourcing the our um, the robots TXC parser and matcher. Uh, we removed certain things from from the parser, and we also blogged about it that didn't make sense from crawling perspective. So, for example, it used to be that, and I know that externally this is still a pain point, but no index was there. Like you could use a no index colon and then path, um, but we really needed, like search engines really needed to have robots.txt just for crawling. Mm. And then you can control with other things, indexing and serving, like generating search results, but robots.txt should just be about crawling and nothing else. So cool. Yeah, I, I never thought about it that way, but it makes total sense. Also, the sitemap file, kind of mentioning that there, then kind of seems like, like the right fit. So maybe it should be renamed into crawling that text no 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 <laughs> no no renaming no you know that um, for the past i think three or four years we've been working with lizzie and uh hanner uh one of the engineers who was working on the google bot team on uh, standardizing the robots txt protocol together with the original author martin and it feels like it's kind of a pain um, <laughs> Any change uh, suggested, I think the more changes were like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, especially now that we are in the finish line of that uh, process. Um, and every single time I see a comment coming in that, oh, you need to update this. It's like, no, just no. What? No. But then if you don't get comments, you're like suspicious. Like, did you look at the thing? Because there have been so many comments before. If there's none, it's like, uh... Something's not right here, potentially. I, I, I think that's just you. That's just me? You wouldn't, if I just, uh, like the change list that you sent me, if I just LGTM'd it, no comments, you would be like, yeah, good. Or would you be suspicious? Gary would just publish it. And it's like, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm sending it to you for comments. I know that you are going to leave comments. Like I could have sent it to to. Edu, one of the engineers who we work with on the uh, parser, and then he would have approved it, but then I would have gotten no improvement comments. We would have gotten the improvement comments by these other people, the uh, committee. Uh, what's the term for them? The group that's reviewing the stuff? Uh, IETF... Uh, Directorates. Directorates, yes. They pay close attention to everything, and I try to anticipate, and still we get comments. I, I think it's a good time for me to bring up the suggestion to rename it to crawling.txt then, right? Oh, nope. no. <laughs> In the open... <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we're closed. We're past that stage, I think. Yeah. So at, at, at this point, we only get comments from the directorate, uh, like from the security directorate or the ARIA review team or whatever. And we, there are no more community contributions which is great because fewer comments, I guess. But yeah, we've been dealing with, with comments for a long time, and uh, I would rather not introduce a change into 
the protocol. Would that mean that people would have to change all of their files, like uh, yep. old named robots text files? They would everything would break. Like it would be chaos. Okay, no chaos. No chaos. We we, can we like that. chaos. We we thrive in chaos. We love chaos. No, no, but uh, so technically it wouldn't change anything because it's down to the implementers to support the things that we mention in the specification. So, for example, if they still want to follow the old naming like robots txt then they could just do that like it's it's not like it's set in stone and if you look at the http standard for example you can find things that browsers in general don't support even though it's in the in the specification so it's it's not like you must absolutely do this it's like here are the considerations that we thought of we think that you must follow this and this, you should follow this and this, but ultimately it's up to you what you do with it. We already talked a lot about robots.txt, so I'm, I would rather not make this an episode about robots.txt again. Okay, so let's return to the, the crawling bucket. What other things do we notice in the crawling stage that's related to a removal? Like how, what other things could we notice at, at that point right away that, hey, uh, somebody has requested uh, that this thing be removed? So there's robots text. What other things would be noticed at the crawling point? Mm, I, I guess the URL removals tool used to be a thing there, where if you flagged a URL parameter as something that we should skip, then that would also be dropped. But that tool doesn't exist anymore, so probably nothing. Or can you think of anything, Gary? I'm thinking about status codes. Oh. Because that's the other thing is if there if like the uh, robots text file is like a 404 or something or like we can't access it then we don't know what to do so that page itself it could be well not 404 because that means that it's missing like 503, 503. or 505 or whatever but not even just that like for example if you return a URL with a 404 status code then that will be removed from search it's not a removal tool like we are we are not saying that it, this is a tool for removing urls i don't think we do um but technically it works and it's just working as intended basically you instruct the client with something well you don't instruct you inform the client well we do say like one way to remove a url would be to like delete it uh so then you would serve the status code so then that would be working as intended as like hey it's gone like cool good job it's out um, so we would have to crawl it and then decide not to index it I mean, if it's 404 or 410 or 403, maybe, then we just wouldn't even pass it on to indexing. We would pass on a signal to indexing that like this URL doesn't exist anymore. And then indexing will decide that then we are going to drop it. OK. So what else happens in the indexing bucket? Not much. <laughs> this is when we would find like all those other tags, like no index, meta tag, no follow, like l things that are on the page, like don't go here, don't go over here, don't stop looking at me. <laughs> so I think in an early episode of Search of the Record, we talked about uh, indexing a little bit. And one of the things that we mentioned was the content parser and rendering. And during those processes, we do extract the meta tags that are relevant to indexing. So for example, rel canonical is extracted, meta robots is extracted, and so on. And if we see something like meta robots, no index, and if we see meta robots, no index, then that will mean that we want to drop that URL from the index. What would happen if You've got other languages, like you've got the no index on one language. Would we then do something about the other languages? Like if I guess if you you've set it as the rel canonical, then so uh, it depends on how the setup is because it can happen that you like for example if we have some sort of duplication. Uh, across languages and Google detects that as a duplication, then it might mean that one no index can affect the whole cluster, but it's hard to trigger it, but nonetheless you can. Okay, so it's something that could happen, but I'm wondering like, is it safe to rely on that or you should put it on every language page uh, just to be sure, like if you did, if you wanted it for sure, not, not indexed or removed, uh, like you should be thinking about all the things or can you just add it to the canonical page and then we will know to, get rid of it, like from just an efficiency perspective, I guess, like I don't want this page. So I therefore also wouldn't want the other pages that I've linked up. You probably want to add it to every page that you want to remove. Mm. I think our setup is more special because we do use Ajaflang. So we are instructing, well, not instructing, but hinting 
to uh, indexing that these are clusters of pages, and then they might influence each other. Might. I mean, oh, no, it sounds like maybe, and if you wanted to be 100% sure, then you would... Uh, that, put so it on that's wall. why I'm saying that we are more special. Like pages with hreflang clusters are more special, and you you have to keep in mind that they might affect each other in the cluster. So th for pages that uh, are not in a cluster, not in an hreflang cluster, for example, there you can just no index the pages that you want to get removed, um, and don't think about anything else. Just remove the page or no index the pages that you want removed. With hreflang clusters, it's, it gets more complicated. Um, also a recurring topic that hreflang is complicated. Yes. 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 Yes, it is. Yes. So how does rendering fit into this? Like if you add the no index robots meta tag with rendering in JavaScript, would would that still work or is that a bad thing? We are trying to figure out what happens with, with rendering, but I think in, in theory it like at least in most of the cases it should work, but we definitely need confirmation from Martin about what's actually happening. And the reason you bring this up is because it's, are we going to see it in time? Like if it's injected with JavaScript, like would we know to not show it because we haven't seen it? Of course, kind of like the timing difference. There might be like a window in between, or if we don't render a page for whatever reason once, then what happens? Right. Like we didn't know that, hey, this is actually no index because we didn't see it when we were rendering, when Googlebot is rendering it. Okay. So basically, be as consistent as possible. Just like if you wanted no index, just no index everywhere. Yes. I'm trying to think of like corner cases, but I, I can't come up with anything useful. How how could you put the meta tag on things like PDFs? Well you can't. Oh. That sucks. <laughs> what can you do there? Like if you have a PDF and you're like, I just don't want this indexed. Or you want it removed, basically. Like you're it's it's being served in search results and you want it removed, how would you go about, I guess you would just delete it? We do support x-robots-tag HTTP header. And then for binary files, um, you can just add that with a noindex thingy. And then that will work like a meta noindex. OK. Uh, so this method, the header method, is this fall, which bucket does this fall into? Would we notice it at the crawling or the indexing stage? Technically, if we notice it in crawling, and then we forward it to indexing, and then indexing will drop it. So th that's the signal that we send with like the 404. So basically, we create a wireframe of whatever we collected about the, the URL, like the timings and the different meta information that we could collect, including the headers. And then based on that, indexing can decide what to do with the page. So basically, in crawling, we just notice it, but we don't actually do anything. It, it will be indexing that will has to do something about it. And same goes for status codes as well. OK. And when you say do something about it, what does that mean? Keep it or drop it. So it's basically a blockchain from no, crawling to indexing. No, blockchain. don't go there. <laughs> no, bad John. <laughs> you can't just join up any words together. <laughs> I'm German. It's like in German, you can just take random words and put them together and make a new word. What if they're existing words? This is a term already. <laughs> then you created a pun. OK. So, so moving on to a third bucket, we can call it Web3. What, no. what happens there? OK. <laughs> <laughs> it's like he's not hearing us <laughs> on purpose, selective listening. <laughs> it's a pleasure working with you, John. <laughs> I have uh, actually a, a question regarding the crawling bucket. Um, so in uh, the docs, we have the unavailable after. I don't know if we talked about this last uh, episode, but there is a part in there that says if you add that, then crawling will slow down over time, which is like interesting, I guess. Is it though? <laughs> yeah. I mean, so so you put it there, like you want it removed, but like we're just slowing down the crawling. We're not stopping completely or like we will st still check back in it, on it. We don't see it as a, hey, remove it. It's a, sort of a soft exit, like a opposite of a soft launch. <laughs> so I don't, I don't actually know how exactly it works or how it's implemented, but my understanding was always that it's a soft exit because we still need to ensure that you are not bullshitting. <laughs> Wait, but I put it there, like, or whoever it is who, who put that tag, like, I guess. No, no, not the tag. Like, you don't but... believe them that the content is actually unavailable yeah, like, after? Yeah, like, like with the, 
like with the last mod tag in uh, in sitemaps. Oh, I see. That's also something that we might use it if we can detect that it's consistently accurate. Okay. My understanding is that same goes for unavailable after. And is this something that people would use to sort of like schedule a removal or something? Like they eventually want it to be removed from search results, so they put it there to sort of like preemptively like, hey, this thing like won't be relevant, but like it could still hang out in search, just crawl me less. And if it falls out eventually, like that's fine with me. I think so. John is aggressively nodding uh, there. Yeah, but he's also sort of making a face. I'm not sure. Like, do, do you concur? Or, uh... <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, my understanding was we we understand from the page that they want to have it go away at some point. And then like either we can just blindly trust it and start hiding that page in search, or we, we double check it at some point, And then it's more like a no index. And then whatever happens there. From maybe a decade ago, some um, auction site, like big auction site, was using this. And they were using it accurately and consistently. And uh, you could actually see the auction pages disappearing from search when the auction expired. It, it might have taken like a day or two because we actually needed to, to crawl the, the, the page again. But it, it actually worked, if nothing else, for scheduling the crawl to, to that date. So going back to the last bucket, I won't mention its name, what kind of Blocking could you do there? So it's basically it's basically indexed in in Google systems. I mean, you can do what Lizzie said, basically removing altogether. But you can also control the snippets that we show. Would this be also like removing the cache? Like the cache gets removed at the serving stage, or no? Like like we still have it, but then that's kind of weird. Um, I think we, it's good that we have the the cache page because. Uh, when the pandemic hit, then uh, we could serve some pages from there when the site went down due to heavy load. Um, but I, I, I usually don't even think about the cache page. But yeah, you, you can remove from the cache page, for example, whatever we have there. You are not removing from search results anything. You are just removing the cache page. So you are controlling the cached page, not the, the content that we might have indexed. So that's the, the no archive meta tag. Right. There's also the cache removal tool. Right. Or we used to have one. And that would be for what purpose? Like you would use, what do you mean we used to have it? We don't have it anymore. I don't know. I haven't taken a look for a while. So I've got to like, do we still have that? Maybe like one of you does. Can you, uh, yeah, I'm wondering, can you use the removals tool to remove the cache page or like what's in the cache? Or would that stomp on the full page too? Like, oh, whoops, we removed the whole thing. Like you just wanted us to remove the cache and there's an updated version. But if you put the cache page in there, would we? Let, let me assume that this tool still exists, because okay. probably it does. But <laughs> otherwise, someone would, would have told us, hopefully. Um, or we would get complaints about it. We, or we would get complaints about it. So I, my understanding is there, there are two ways that you can remove a page with these tools. One is you remove it completely if you're like, I don't want this page at all to be visible in search. And the other is. It removes the snippet that is shown and the cache page, which is oh yeah, like I changed something on this page and I want Google to like refresh it, like show refresh show it. the new one, like and stop definitely showing. don't show the old one for the time being, kind of thing. Like you, I don't know, you put a wrong phone number on a page and people are calling your neighbor instead of you. You could say like fix this as quickly as possible, or at least hide it. From from people seeing it, I guess would most people think like recrawl the URL, like not remove the cache, is sort of a like a way to think about the same thing, but maybe not typical. I think the removing the snippet in the cache page is more for people who are not the site owner. So for them, they can't go to Search Console and say like, "Hey, recrawl this random person's web page for me, please." Uh, but they can go and say, like, actually, the information on this page has changed, and I need you to reflect that in search as quickly as possible. And it's quite an important aspect. Um, I think that, like, if uh, someone wrote something about you and it was not accurate, um, then you definitely want it to 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 be gone from search once they updated the article or whatever. And is this happening in the rendering bucket? No, this we are already in serving bucket. We're already like in we, serving. Oh, okay. We, we we left we left you behind. Oh, whoops. <laughs> and then we have uh, the, the normal removal tool, which you can actually use to remove uh, 
whole result from search results. And from our perspective, is that like going through all the buckets again, or does it like jumpstart you? So that's um, removing from search result. Like the, the phrasing was important there because it is just hiding from search results in the first step. And if you're a site owner and you want something gone from search completely, like from the index and from search results, then you also have to take one of the previous actions. Like for example, add a no index or, well, just add a no index, that's the best one. Or remove completely, like 404, return 404, 410. Um, but otherwise, the removal tool that will just remove the search result itself. Ah, and is that why it's so fast? Or it's the faster method? Yes, that's correct. Yes. And that's also why we have it. Because in some cases, at least, we cannot refresh the index that fast. Right. It may sound really weird, but sometimes it may take months to remove a result from, from our actual index. Then does it just get removed from the data center that the serving is happening at? Or does it drop out when you search? So it's it drops out when you search. So basically, that re like if you if the removal tool was used on a result and the result is still in the index, while well, the URL is still in the index, then we would normally do the the retrieval that we do for any other result. But then we would not present that result to the user to any user. But it doesn't necessarily flag the page to not be crawled again. So we could go visit it and see, well, you want like, to crawl it again, right? But say the person used the removals tool. That doesn't prevent it from like from us finding it again. They would have to do some other thing because we're still going to attempt it. That's correct. That's why you want to use no index or a 404 or whatever. And then that will permanently remove, well, not permanently, because if it comes back or the no index is dropped, then it would come back. But um, it would remove page that has the no index or returns with a 404 from our search index. So that sounds like a lot of work every time to do, like when someone searches, because like you search for something and it comes back and it's like, oh, this search was done in 0 0.005 seconds. I, I guess it has to look through the whole removals file every time. That's like pretty crazy. Wow. Well, but you load it in memory. And and then if you load it in memory, then it, like you don't have seek times, you don't, you don't have anything. So it's not, not that bad. Is, is that why regular expressions can't be done there? John, stop it. <laughs> Regex. Oh. That's how I say it. <laughs> I'm surrounded by regexers. So, so basically, Google systems are just like face palming whenever I try to submit something like that. Well, I'm not sure if they are face palming. I think they are just assuming that that's part of the URL. <laughs> <laughs> very interesting URL structure you have going like, on. <laughs> yeah, very weird URL. I think, um, like theoretically, we could support some form of regex to some extent, but I'm I'm not sure that would do any good. Like people would wipe out their sites in very or new kinds of imaginative ways i i've heard regular expressions are hard i i don't know what they mean with that but oh so next time i have a regex problem i will just go to you because you're a regex expert regex experts yes next time on search off the record we'll be taking a look at accessibility which is kind of the opposite of blocking specifically for your site We've been having fun with these podcast episodes, and I hope you, the listener, have been finding them both entertaining and insightful as well. Uh, feel free to drop me a note on Twitter or chat with us at one of the next events that we go to if you have any thoughts. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you, and goodbye. Bye-bye. Farewell. Farewell.